Chapter 12, Industrial and Enterprise Networking. Here at the final chapter of our textbook, we're going to be looking at a collection of different topics. I mean, honestly, we're going to be over the map here a little bit. But they all come back to one common theme, and that's IT in enterprise. And we're going to look at some of the areas that it takes it beyond just the pure technology, a lot of what we've been looking at all semester long, and seeing how it's actually implemented. Right? We've got a lot of stuff in our networks that don't meet the definition of a quote-unquote computer, but they still fall under our purview. They, we're still responsible for them. Also, a big part of our jobs as IT professionals has nothing to do with technology whatsoever. It has to do with business decisions. I've been saying this all semester long. The only reason IT exists is to facilitate business processes. And that's it. Right? No, our users don't care how fancy our networks are or how tricked out our switches are. They don't care. What they care about is when they click on something, it works. And what the company cares about is that employees click on things that perform some business process which makes money. So in these terms, what we're looking at is our IT environments are actually considered industrial networks. Now, not every location is going to have an industrial network. Some locations, office buildings, that type of thing, purely administrative functions, will be more of the classical PCs on the desktop, wireless systems, that kind of stuff. But in many environments, we're talking factory floors. We're talking assembly lines. They're everywhere, but they, have, they require IT infrastructures also. The difference is that there's a lot of things on those networks which aren't quote-unquote computers. That's the whole point of this whole Internet of Things uh, statement here. It's just, we're going to be stuff on there that's not computers. They're going to be assembly machines, and, well, we'll take a look at some. Overall... We can, we can group these things into, into different categories, right? The big category are industrial control systems. And this is really nothing but leveraging IT technology to drive an industrial process. Think assembly line, right? This makes up not just the extra hardware out there, but the software that goes along with it. A lot of equipment crosses the line between this is a piece of industrial equipment for like a lathe or hammering out pieces of sheet metal or melting rubber into certain shapes, whatever, into the IT infrastructures. In many cases, they are absolutely attached to our IT infrastructures. They become part of our business process that we have to maintain. This could be like a programmable logic controller for some piece of industrial equipment, again, like a metal stamp or something like that. It's automated. It would have updates. It would send, it would send data to various, various locations. Control data, what, kind of, what shape are we going to cut? You know, laser cutting units, all that kind of stuff. These become IT assets that we need to care for. And we have to treat this just like we do other IT assets. We need to inventory them, for one. We need to know what we have. We need to know where they connect into our, our regular user network, if they do at all. In a lot of cases, these things don't need to be on the Internet. I don't want those networked. They have no reason to be out there. People, I mean, no one has to be using a lathe to go web surfing. What they, what they might be able to do, though, is, is be segregated and protected. And uh, if, I, if, I can, if I can protect it, then I'm making my, my environment safer. If my industrial systems got hacked and were denial of service, well, that could have some real business implications for me. Now, this really all comes around to asset, asset management, right? Industrial systems, regular IT systems. I've been harping on this all semester. Documentation, documentation, documentation. We need to have it. You need to know what you have, 
What, how many computers do we have? How many servers do we have? What versions of things are they running? What patch levels are they at? What pieces of hardware do they have? All of it, right? These are business documents. And if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to effectively manage your network. There's all kinds of really non-technical documents that you're going to be dealing with as an IT professional. And, you know, really, you're going to be creating a lot of these. Yes, being an IT person, IT administrator, an IT manager, requires a great bit of writing. You need to know how to communicate. You're going to see documents like this, RFPs, which are requests for proposals. You have some project that you need done in your environment, maybe some upgrade or whatever, and you're going to outsource it. We do this all the time especially if you have a very small IT staff or very limited or very, very busy. Why tax them? You've got to bring in outside experts to do the job for you. Consultants. Well, what you do is you issue what's called a request for proposal, and you send that to all the different consultants because you want them to, go, to, to compete with each other, hopefully. And the consulting firm then evaluates that RFP and generates a proposal. Right? That proposal is going to contain all kinds of information on it. It might be something like a memorandum of understanding, which is really the, the legal contract. These can get pretty detailed. And even if you're not the one that's creating the entire contract, a lot of times we have legal departments for that. Lawyers don't understand the, the, the ins and outs of the projects, but you do. You might see a statement of works. This is just an agreement that says, hey, here's exactly what we're going to do for a particular project. If I'm entering into a long-term relationship with a vendor, we're going to have a service level agreement. Now, again, here's another type of contract. These real, most of these are just different kinds of contracts that define the boundaries of what you're doing. Right? If they're, they're taking care of your systems, what kind of downtime is acceptable? How soon will they bring you, do they guarantee they'll have somebody on site to fix your stuff? If you're, it's an agreement with an ISP, you know, what kind of bandwidth are you going to get? And what's its uptime? How available is it going to be to me? It's all defined in SLAs. Another IT function we have is change management. Now, a lot of people like to go in and just change things willy-nilly and do whatever. That is horrible in an enterprise environment. The bigger your environment is, the more complex it is, the more critical this becomes. You can't just go around changing things. You'll break them. And if I break something in the middle of the workday or in the middle of, of, of getting ready for some, some production process, well, that's going to cost our, our company money. It's very likely going to be a resume generating event for the person responsible for it. So change management, and this is administrative overhead. This is an administrative function. It is good. Our, our environment's like it, and it's good for us because it gives us some protection on a personal level, personal liability. And really all this is is if you're going to go and change something, you're going to do an upgrade or whatever, you have to go in there with a plan ahead of time. You have to have a schedule. You have to know exactly what you're doing. Things like patches. That happens all the time, right? Patch Tuesday for Microsoft products. Well, I don't just want to install them on their own. On our home machines, we do this all the time. But in our industrial environments, that patch might break something. And if it breaks something, business processes don't happen, money doesn't get made, and it's just bad all the way around. So you need to have a plan for that. How are we going to install our patches? How do we test it first? How do we make certain that it's not going to break things? How do we undo it in the event that it does break something? Testing is fantastic, and it's a required step. You really, really want to test upgrades, patches, new systems, whatever, before you roll them out to production. That's a key, that's a key part of our jobs. But in part of that plan, in part of that change plan, you better, have a, you better have a section in there that talks about how do we undo it in the event that something goes wrong that we didn't catch in testing. It totally happens. We're human. Our test environments, while we try to make them emulate our production environments as close as possible, sometimes miss things.
we don't want to make changes unnecessarily, right? IT people hate changes. Changes break things. Th uh, that creates downtime, which ruins our weekends. We don't like that. So don't make a change if it's not required. You're going to spend a lot of time looking on the day after Patch Tuesday, going through it, because you haven't installed them yet, going through the release notes on all these different upgrades and patches and service packs and all that kind of stuff, and, and figure out if you actually need them in your environment. If you don't, and it's not a security-related item, although those need to be looked at also, don't do it. The BIOS on servers is a prime example of this. Some people want to go and flash their BIOS every single time a new release comes. Well, the BIOS is just a limited operating system that's stored in non-volatile RAM on your motherboard for the purpose of booting up the system. So it gets patches. You have a Dell system, an HP system, absolutely you'll have patches for it. If I, if I go to flash that BIOS and something goes wrong, I have a power outage in the middle of the thing, whatever, I just bricked my server. Now I can't even boot it. Now I've got a problem. Right? This short little job all of a sudden became a real headache. So read the release notes. Don't do it unless it fixes a problem that you're experiencing. Or it's a, it's a relevant security uh, patch. It used to be that having a testing lab, well, that was in the realm of your bigger or more wealthy comp companies. Because you do have to have basically a scaled-down version of your network that reflects the real network close enough to make testing reliable or to make it even practical. In this day of virtualization, and especially infrastructure as a service services that you can get from Amazon Web Servers or Rackspace or whatever, having a testing lab becomes a lot more approachable to more organizations, even the small ones. Don't skimp on this. One little discussion about maintenance windows. This is one of the reasons why as IT people we don't get a lot of sleep. I'm not going to do any change in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the business day. If we're in operation and we're open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and we're, again, some factory floor, we're, we're, we're in assembly line, well, I'm not going to change anything from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Why? Because if I break something, then production stops, money gets lost, resumes get generated. What we do is establish maintenance windows, and we do these during the times of least productivity. And quite frankly, a lot of times that falls like 2, two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And it really does. That's your maintenance window. The setting up of the maintenance window, not a technology decision, a business decision. And it has a firm boundary. It's got a start time and a stop time, and you're required to stay within that start and top time. Hence, the testing environment. Changes really... We've already talked about some of this. We have, we have to understand what we're changing. We have to have a written plan for it. We have to have tested it. We have to let people know. We'll see here in a minute in many organizations, especially those that require high availability, these decisions to make a change extend beyond IT. Right? You may have to meet a, a, something called the CCB, Configuration Change Board. And this is a formal board made up of stakeholders and executives throughout your organization Sometimes they meet much a week, sometimes they meet once a month, whatever. And before you change anything, you have to go and get the permission of the board to do it. Their job is to make sure that your change is well vetted, that you're just not going in there without having all your ducks in a row. So what they're going to try to do is, sh is shut you down, to find holes in your plan. And if they find something, and they're actually pretty good at this usually, Back to the drawing board, back to your test system, firm it up, and then go back and meet the next time. If this is a monthly board, then you have to plan ahead. These projects require a lot of, a, a, a lot of planning, a lot of enterprise class planning. Your documentation you present to the change management board, especially, pretty much needs to be watertight. If they know what they're doing, they will find holes in it and shoot it down. Also, though, even if we're not into that degree of, of, of change management, maybe change management happens within IT 
you know, you have to go no further than the IT manager. Doesn't matter. Document it. Holy cow, document it. You need to understand exactly what, 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 what you're doing. You also need to document the process as you're performing it. This went right. This went wrong. We had to change this. Something like this happened. You need to record all this stuff. If somebody else has to follow you, especially if something broke and it's not obvious at first, they need a, a script. What happened? What did they actually do? Right? Even if it's your own work, even if it's yourself, document, document, document. You're going to be busy. And the odds are you will not remember in great detail what you did six months ago. Make sure you, make sure you, you document the changes that you make. A big part of IT security, and we love talking about stuff like firewalls and intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. Those are great. But if I don't have adequate physical security, all of that is nothing. Start at the basic, physical security. What this really means, a lock on the door. You'd be amazed how many, especially smaller organizations, have their wiring closets, their IDF closets, out there in hallways and reception areas and all that, and they're completely unlocked. Anyone can just walk in there. They're not monitored, nothing. If I get my hands on your network switch, I own it, and I, 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 I'm in on your network. Physical security is huge. There's all kinds of ways we can do this. It can be as simple as putting a lock on the door and then giving keys to your IT team. Right? It doesn't have to be a high-tech system. That works. If I don't want to have to manage keys or I have a bigger I, IT staff, well, I might need to move to like a cipher lock. Right? This is just a lock with a little keypad on it and a combo. Everybody on the team gets the combo, and there you go. Now, if I have this kind of setup, guess what I have? I have to change my combos. You've got five people in your team. They all have the combo. It's one, two, three, four, five. And Bob leaves. Well, you fire Bob. He was incompetent. Well, Bob knows that combo. So now we have to go in and change it. It's, it's a basic thing, but it's not something you can ignore. Where do I put my, 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 my locks? Do I want to lock just the data center? Do I want to lock just the, do I want to put a lock over here for the IT department and not the data center? Business decisions. I may not want all my IT employees to have access to the data center, right? I want to control access to the IT department because we get a lot of stuff going on there. A lot of access happens from here. I don't want, accounting or shipping and receiving or whatever just wandering around into our IT department. So I might have to have layers of security. I might have to put badge readers, we'll look at those here in a second, or locks or cipher locks on the doors to the department and then a second set on the doors to the server room. And then only certain employees have the proper badge or the proper password to get into here. What's the right answer? It depends. These are business decisions. I could go even further if I want. You know, cipher locks are a pain in the butt. How about a proximity card? These are just smart cards. You put it next to the scanner, bleep, and if you have the, and if it, it identifies you, and if you're allowed in, you're in. Now, there's a downside to that. What if someone steals your card? In some cases, you may not care. You might be willing to take that risk. In other cases, you may have to implement a multi-factor authentication. Right? You have to have the card, something you have, and type in a PIN, something you know. And it takes a combination of those two to get through that door. Need to go even more? How about multi-factor authentication, three-factor authentication, biometrics? In this case, I might need something I know, a PIN, Something I have, I also have to swipe a card or have a proximity card, and something that I am, my fingerprint. We use fingerprint readers all the time. iPhones have had them for a few years now for unlocking your screen. This isn't cost prohibitive technology. Now, the more layers of security I put on, the more secure I get. However, yeah, overhead, I've got to manage it. We can go beyond this. How about video surveillance? How do you know 
what that janitor who has access to your to your IT department, let's say, because well, you need to have it cleaned. <laughs> Someone needs to take out the trash and vacuum it, otherwise it'll get skunky in there pretty fast. Fine, we're going to give the janitor access to the IT department. This room right here. We're not going to do the data room. What we'll probably do on that is, is there are commercial companies that provide cleaning services for data centers, and you don't, you only do them certain times, maybe three, four times during a year, whatever. So I'm going to give my janitor access to the IT department. Well, I've already said there's lots of equipment in there. There's lots of resources in there. There's lots of access to our environments. I want to know what that person is doing in there. So I might set up video cameras inside my inside my inside my IT department. I'm probably going to put most definitely put them inside my server room if I care about it that much. There's all kinds of different solutions for this. There are cameras that feed basically digital video recorders. There are other ones that are IP cameras. They're actually an industrial system all in their own right that send their video. They just stream video across the IP network. And it saves that data on disk somewhere. Right? We could get so in depth that we actually have a security office, like with physical security guards there. Well, that security office would, might have the wall of video screens. I would have somebody sitting there 24-7 monitoring the video. We can get as in-depth on this as we need to. It all depends. Does the business processes justify this level of security? If it's just mom and pop's corner store that, you know, they sell bubble gum and, I don't know, skateboards or whatever, I'm just making something up there, probably not. If you're a company that deals with credit card information, HIPAA, which is your, which is the health information stuff, things that can get that can cost your company millions of dollars or potentially send people to prison if it gets compromised, well, yeah, then this becomes much more justifiable. How do I do this? How do I even do my security plan? There are security professionals out there. It's probably not something you want to do on a DYI, but it is going to be a business process. Right, you got to figure out what are we securing and what make what areas are going to be more tightly secured than others. Sometimes security takes things we don't even think about. A failed system, let's say. This PC was on somebody's desk for four years. It finally expired. It's gone. So we're going to send it off to get recycled. What about the hard drive that's inside of it? If you send that hard drive out there, that may have all that all that information that we're trying so hard to secure. Maybe it does it, but maybe it does, especially like for home computers. Right? You got your computer at home, your laptop, you do your online banking and all that kind of stuff on there. Well, when your laptop finally dies and you send it off to Goodwill for recycling, because they do do recycling of computer parts for free, which is nice, take the hard drive out of it. At the very least. Now, you can do things like run drive sanitizer programs. There's one out there called D-Band, uh, Derek's Boot and Nuke. That does, that does a pretty good job on it. Maybe I don't trust that. Maybe I need more. Well, there are commercial companies out there that will shred your hard drive. And you send it off. In a, a, it, it can be as in-depth as having a courier send it out there or send it through FedEx with some type of tracking information, higher level of security for the tr transition. And you pay this company money, and they, when they'll shred your drive and send you back a certificate of destruction. How do I know they actually did it? Well, I get that certificate. So what? Well, if the information on that drive was compromised and somebody goes to sue you for it, you've done your due diligence, especially if you went for an actual certified company that does this. Yes, it costs something. Again, a business decision. Is, uh, are our business processes, what we're trying to protect, our data, does that justify the cost? That depends. But as the IT person, you will have a, a, a large say in that. We also have to kind of look at what happens when things don't go right. What happens if we have a security breach? Somebody kicks in the door to our server room and steals a bunch of stuff. What do we do? You need to have a plan. This is not something you just want to make up as you go after the fact. 
There's a couple of different ways we can look at this. We might want to look at it in terms of an overall disaster. Now, a disaster is a catastrophic event to our entire, our, our, our entire infrastructure. I'm not just talking about a server burst into flames or drive crashes, right? That's what we have backups for. What if our building burns down? What if a hurricane comes in and wipes it off the face of the earth? Back in the 90s, we used to talk about disaster recovery all the time, but it was kind of like, yeah, the odds of that are happening are pretty slim. But then all kinds of things happened. We all know what happened on 9-11, and then 2000 time, 2005 time frame, Hurricane Katrina came in and wiped out a good part of New Orleans. Well, this, these disasters can happen. That's what, that's what those events showed us. So now disaster recovery is a real thing we have to think about. you got to create a plan on it. And you're going to assume this could be worst case scenario. Right? How do we do this? How do we, how do we keep business operations going when our computer systems and our powers and, our, and, uh, and everything is just offline? It's just not going to work. Generally, what this means is having a second data center somewhere. Now, until the advent of virtualization, this was in, again, this was something for wealthy companies, government and Fortune 500s and that kind of stuff. Because if I'm going to have a second data center, I'm adding a lot of expense. And it's a site that I hope I never have to use. So, you know, it's kind of like buying life insurance. You really want it, but wow, I'm, no, I'm in no hurry to use mine. Well, I had different ways I could implement this. And this is a little dated, but there's still, it's because again, the virtual thing totally changes this. It makes DR accessible to everybody, including at home. But the, the concepts are still sound. How in depth do I want my, my, my second data center to be? I might have something called a coal site which means I have a facility somewhere. If I'm sitting here in Boston, I might have a facility in Denver, Colorado. They don't get many hurricanes. And I've got a bunch of parts there. I've got, my, I've got components and servers and stuff like that, but they're sitting in boxes. They're just sitting there not doing much of anything, locked away and safe. And if something happens to our Boston location, I take all my IT people, I put them on, a, on an aircraft, and I fly them over there to Denver, and they start racking and stacking and, and configuring and updating and all this type of stuff. That may be a less costly solution for me, but I'm going to be down longer. Right? It's going to take me time to get there. It could be a week before I come back online again. Can my business processes survive that type of outage? Maybe I'll make it a warm site. Right? My site over in Denver... The servers are racked and stacked. They're running. They have network connectivity. We might even be, we might even be updating them. It's not a, a carbon copy of our production environment, but again, if I, something happens to our Boston site, everybody hops on a plane, gets over to the to, to Denver. They have less to do. Now, one of your big considerations here is how do I get the data, which is really what we're protecting from the primary site to the secondary site. Well, that's a consideration right there. If my business processes say, I can't have any downtime. No, 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 no. We can't even down an hour. I may not have much choice. I might have to go with a hot site. And that's where my, my, my DR site is an exact duplicate of my primary site. And data is sent across to the, to the backup site live or synchronously, or at least near real time. If the business requirement says we can't lose more than an hour's worth of data, then I have to have that data mirrored in the hot site in an hour or less. This is my, by far my, mo my most highly available option, and it's by far my most expensive option. Because traditionally, if I bought a server, I had to buy two. One for my primary site, one for my, my, my backup site. If we did a change in the primary site, well, we had to do the same change over in the DR site, and they had to be identical. There's a lot of overhead involved in this. But if you have the needs for it, you have options available too.
that security policy thing we were talking about that we, we discussed you know what am I going to do in the event of a security breach well it should include some plans in there to who is going to deal with the breach this is probably not something you want your new junior admins or your interns working for you right now we're getting into the realm of forensics somebody hacked into you and stole a bunch of information stole a bunch of uh, credit card in numbers or social security numbers and you are in the hot seat for it well how do we go about figuring out what happened well, that's the role of forensics that's the role of cybersecurity. large organizations might have their own internal information security team in in-house right who, who, who specialize in this or you may have to hire a third-party consultant if you're especially for a smaller organization who specialize in this what they're going to do is they're going to come in and, go and, and collect data. What happened? What got compromised? What didn't? This is actually falls into the realm of criminal investigations, right? The data they collect might be used to prosecute the people who attacked you. Well, guess what? If that, inf that, da that evidence, if that's what it becomes at that point, becomes corrupted in some way or compromised, your court case just went bye-bye. And ultimately, the liability could come down to you make certain your IT teams and this is the most junior admin your interns everybody understand the process or your security plan for dealing with it one mistake internally could wreck the whole forensics process and look at that with that we conclude chapter 12 and we conclude our textbook Excellent. You've done it. We're not done with the course yet, but we're moving right along. As always, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to reach out to me, and I will see you next week.